Hey everybody, Alex Stevenson here and joined by Jake Face and we are doing a little episode of Mortar Pod for you for this week. So, uh, Jake, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? I am excellent. Uh, just a quick reminder, the Mortar Pod is brought to you by SeemsGoodMagic.com. It's our website where we post draft videos for Journey into Nyx. Very soon it's going to be some vintage masters right around the corner. Pre-release is June 13th, 14th, and 15th, and today we are recording on, what is it, the 7th or 8th, so that's just like yeah. just a couple days around the corner, and we've got Vintage Masters online, um, which is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. I don't have a ton of experience with it. I think you and I looked through the spoilers <laughs> a little bit, but uh, I don't know. There's some There's some pretty unusual little cards in there that I wasn't expecting them to put in. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a... A fun set, I think. I, I'm excited to try it, I guess. Yeah, did they have, like, commander cards in there or something? Was that right? Uh, they put some commander, I'm sure, and then they put uh, the conspiracy cards in there. Oh, weird. That's right. Yeah. So, um, I guess it was because they're not bringing conspiracy online. They're trying to give you a little taste of conspiracy and mm -hmm. still allow you to play the staples and vintage yeah. Uh, so that's cool. Yeah, Vintage Master is going to be fun. I'm definitely planning to draft that a ton, which means I'm probably going to be stopping uh, the journey into Nick's drafts in just a couple days here. Uh, I, I'm sure you can look up the price on it. I haven't yet uh, on how much Vintage Master's drafts are going to cost. I assume they're going to cost quite a bit, uh, probably 20 to 25, mm -hmm. possibly 30, but we'll see. All right, well, we've got a lot to cover today, so we're just going to jump right into it. Six, 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 cyclical evolution. Cyclical evolution. This is the uh, segment of the show where we talk about old cycles from old sets. We're systematically, chronologically going through every single uh, old set and looking for all the weird cycles. Now, uh, I think at first our first goal was kind of to like put every single cycle ever on there. But it's, it's kind of been a lot more, I think, unique and fun to do what we're doing, which is, I think some of the, I mean, there's been a couple that we could have considered cycles yeah. that we didn't put on there. So, we're definitely not getting them all. But. Yeah, in that respect, we're doing it a little bit arbitrarily, but you do get kind of a taste for the weird cycles that you probably, like, never thought were cycles. Mm -hmm. And that's been kind of the fun part of this. So, today is going to be Visions and Weatherlight, finishing off the... Mirage Block series here. So, first we've got the Chimeras. We've got Brass Talon Chimera, Iron Heart Chimera, Lead Belly Chimera, and Ten Wing Chimera. Besides the fact that they're all Chimeras, they all have names that have hyphenated names, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. They're also all four mana artifact creatures that are two twos, and then they all have. Uh, apparently, they needed to say count as Chimera because this is before artifact creatures had. <laughs> yeah. Creature. creature type. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but they all also have sacrifice abilities where you can give plus two, plus two uh, counters, also dated, mm -hmm. uh, to Chimeras and give them abilities. So the four abilities um, are First Strike, Vigilance, Trample, and Flying. And I love how they say permanently on them, too. Mm -hmm. a, lot think... of, a lot of aspects of this card that's dated, for sure. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that they decided to go with um, Vigilance instead of with Banding because they had keyworded Banding, but they hadn't keyworded Vigilance, you know? So it's funny that they opted to go with something that was going to end up being a keyworded ability eventually anyway, you know? Maybe too Just, good. You mean Banding is too good? Or what? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it is too good to put on it. I mean, 
you and I well, uh, got a chance to play with it in Mirage Block, and I got I, I felt it was pretty insane mechanic. It's very good. Yeah, it's yeah. a very very strong mechanic. Yeah, Bandit um, was sweet to play with. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it it would be very good, and especially I can only imagine what the implications of like I get to attack with this guy, that's my banding Chimera, and then put all the damage onto him, sack him, give banding to one of my other Chimeras for defense. You know. Wait, how does banding work with uh, Death Touch? Sorry to interrupt, but is it like... Uh, well, only the creature with Death Touch would have it, and if... if you're... No, you're going up against it. So you oh, have banding, can you, you distribute put, you all of it? You, as the banding player, get to put all of it on one creature. Okay, even though um, with like Death Touch and multi-blocks, you can just split the damage, or Death Touch and trample, it goes right over... Um, with banding, you can just make it all go to one creature, even though it would only take one point to... I think with Trample, you have to deal enough to each blocking creature, and then you decide how the rest of the damage gets dealt. So you would have to assign at least one to each still, and then you would oh, okay. get to go over. But I'm not 100% sure, because I'm almost... I just feel like you can just do all the damage assigning for banding. And wow. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I feel like with trample in particular, it's like gets confusing. You, you might actually trample over something, but I think you're just you're always the one that benefits. So I think Jeez. that you can actually screw over trample. Cool. Well, this is a cool cycle, regardless. Um, very dated, but I like how they're all like super kind of basic backgrounded pictures. I actually really like their backgrounds. I was noticing that earlier. They've got kind of a machinery look, like mm -hmm. blueprints in the background. Yeah, really true. Cool. So you, yeah, almost like the process of how they were built. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, next we have a land cycle. So we've got Coral Atoll, or Atoll, Dormant Volcano, Karoo, Everglades, and Jungle Basin. So this is a cycle of lands that they come in tapped, and when they come in, you bounce the uh, land type that you know uh, an contains... untapped ver version of the basic land type mm -hmm. and then you get a land that taps for a color and a colorless so it taps for two but comes in tapped and you have to bounce an untapped land so quite a requirement actually mm -hmm. and jake you had sort of stated that for a commander these are really only playable in the monocolor commander decks yeah if you're not monocolor then don't bother with these like these are really just there so that I mean, they they were fine at the time, maybe to an extent. They're really only good in commander if you're mono color, and then and then only barely because that untapped land part you think it's not relevant, but it's so relevant. You know, that require extra requirement just makes it a little more. Mm -hmm. No, I agree totally. Uh, that was kind of the nice thing about the bounce lands. You mm -hmm. don't have to. They don't, you get to tap it the didn't, land and like, then bring it necessarily in. slow down your mana or your development if you had it play that turn. Yep, totally. And those almost now, in retrospect, after looking at these, seem like the total upgrades to these. Like, that mm -hmm. was what they intentionally did. Yeah, I think so. Okay, next we have Desolation, Dream Tides, Honorable Passage, Elephant Grass, and Heat Wave. So, uh, why don't you, you want to say the relationship these have? Uh, these are, of course, the color hose cycle of this uh, set because they just couldn't not do it it seemed like for a long time um this goes it's only one color that it hates on but it also can affect everything um so for example desolation is an enchantment for one colorless and two black at the end of each turn each player who tapped the land for mana during that turn sacks the land if a plane is planes is sacked uh, Desolation deals two damage to its controller. Okay. Dream Tides is two and two blue. Creatures do not untap during their controller's untap phase, and each non-green creature's controller may pay an additional two during his or her upkeep to untap that creature. I see. So green creatures stay perma-tapped, but yeah. other creatures still get punished. Yeah. I see. Um, honorable Passage is two mana instant, one colorless, one white, prevent all damage to you or target creature from any one source. If that source is red, Honorable Passage deals to that source's controller an amount of damage equal to the damage prevented. Um, I see. 
Elephant Grass is a one green enchantment. This still sees legacy play. Cumulative upkeep one. Black creatures can't attack you. Non-black creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays an additional two. I uh, see why. It's that's a really yeah. cheap. Uh, what what's the uh, the white enchantment I'm thinking of that does the same thing? Um, ghostly prison yeah, or so, propaganda. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's like a one. It's like a one green version of yeah, that. Yeah, with yes. a like. With accumulative upkeep, but you can keep it around for the first a two, couple turns, three, yeah. or four turns, and it's you're golden at that yeah. point. Um, the fact that cumulative upkeep works in a way where you get the effect for that turn when you're tapped out, but then you can get rid of it and be totally untapped means that you could replay a new elephant grass that following turn for one mana, you cool. know, yeah. reset it. So elephant grass is really good. Um, Heat wave is the last of this cycle, and it's two colorless and a red. Cumulative upkeep, one red. Blue creatures cannot block creatures you control. Non-blue creatures cannot block creatures you control unless their controller pays an additional one life for each blocking creature. Okay, so... Interesting. Yeah, totally. So it seems like this cycle, they were like, well, how about we have a color hate spell that maybe isn't completely useless against non? Yeah, this is... It's funny in that these are almost cards that you could play main deck in a lot of cases, even Honorable Passage to an extent is something that could work if you were, I mean, against a red deck, it's just ridiculous, but um, against any other color, it's still okay. Desolation is something you could easily build around. Um, Dream Tides is just a huge screw you to creature decks. I mean, Dream Tides is like a really strong card. Yeah, you had that in your Thassa Commander deck, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, I do. Um and it's just a it's because it's such a good card. Yeah. Um <laughs> Screw Green decks is crazy. We have a friend that plays Nylia. Nylia. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm sure he was, hates that. Yeah, really great to see against him. Um, this is a yeah. cool cycle idea, though. I like it. So it's yeah. like color hate, but hey, maybe... W I mean, they probably wouldn't do this anymore since we've already said they kind of strayed away from color hate, but mm -hmm. this was them kind of pushing the boundaries on power level of it even more. Yeah, they were almost like... Or versatility of yeah, it, I should say. Our, ver our our color hate's not good enough. We need to give you a little better color hate. Is yeah, it's true. It's like, with this. it's and like, dude, the color flexible. hate you give us is way too good. Stop true. it. It was flexible <laughs> color hate when it was unnecessary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's try the next one out. We got Elkin Lair, Eye of Singularity, Pillar uh, Tombs of Aku, and Teferi's Realm. So right off the bat, I can see they're all world enchantments. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, is this just uh, the cycle of world enchantments, or is there an actual relationship between them? It's pretty much just world enchantments. They're such such a unique thing that when it they warrants come, mentioning, yeah, okay. it's just something worth mentioning. So Elkin Lair, uh, four mana red one, four mana red world enchantment, and during each upkeep, you got to discard a card at random and set it aside, and then the player can play that card as though it were in his his or her hand. And if they don't play the card by the end of the turn, you get rid of it. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's almost it's pretty much do nothing at a certain point in the game but yeah. yeah oh for sure but it's still a cool idea i have singularity uh when it comes in bury all permanents with the same name so destroy all permanents with the same name except basic lands and then it was that's kind of crazy wow yeah and whenever any permanent other than a basic land comes into play bury any permanent already in play with the same name wow so talk about hosing uh some lands you could really mess somebody up with that yeah, this could be a real screw you. Um, don't quite understand what they were going for here. Everything's legendary, I guess, is what they were kind of doing. Which later, we'll see, they did on a ley line. They, but, yeah, uh, they actually did that, and that's much better. That's fine. Um, we've got Pillar Tombs of Aku next. During each player's upkeep, they got a sack of creature, where they lose five life, and then you get rid of Pillar Tombs of Aku. So that one... Uh, looks like it's a little more squashy. It does this little five damage, and then it's out of town. It's out of there. Mm -hmm. So it feels a little less enchant world because of that, because it's yeah. you know, weaker. Because it just goes away, I feel like, relatively fast sometimes, you know? Basically, it's like a four mana, five damage to your opponent. Mm -hmm. um, or, I mean, if they've got chumps, they just sack them. There's also Teferi's Realm, the blue one. This is a three mana enchantment. And at the beginning of each player's upkeep, they have to choose an artifact creature. They choose 
artifacts, creatures, lands, or global enchantments. So non-aura non, enchantments. Non-aura and non-world enchantments. And then it. all cards of that type phase out. I think the Oracle text on it would just be non-aura enchantment, right? Well, it's non-world too. They would have to put that on the uh, Oracle? Yeah, I think so. I, I think so. I'm going to look. But I doubt I they did. Positive. Why? I don't know. I, I bet they count world as global now, but maybe you're right. I think it probably just says non-aura enchantment. Well, then it would just phase itself out. Your opponent, like in a multiplayer game, it would just immediately phase itself out. Oh, maybe. Oh, okay. Well, what's it say on the Oracle text? Um, nope, it is non-aura. You're right. Interesting. So it does phase itself out. So in a multiplayer game, the first player could just say non-aura enchantments, and then everyone else up until your turn would be unaffected by it, and then you would also have to choose something during your turn. Hmm. And then your the first opponent could do the same thing. They could just constantly name enchantment. That's weird. Okay. Um, so yeah, that didn't quite pan out like it was originally designed, I think. Uh, no. Interestingly enough, not too much of a relationship between these cards, but besides the fact that they're enchant worlds, like we said, and uh, this is the last uh, block that'll have it, right? Or is there... Yeah, no, this is the actually the last set that's going to do it. So oh, okay. These are the last ones that were ever printed. Unfortunately, a failure, but cool, uh, cool idea. Just kind of poorly mm -hmm. executed, I think. Yeah. All right, next we have the Charm Cycle from Visions. So we have Emerald Charm, Funeral Charm, Vision Charm, Hearth Charm, and Hope Charm. So the green one untaps permanence, destroys non-aura enchantments, or makes a creature lose flying. The black one uh, makes a player choose and discard a card, which is sweet because it's instant speed, by the way. Uh, gives a creature plus two, minus one, which is sweet, so it's removal. Or gives a creature Swamp Walk, which, okay, that one's not that great. But the other two modes on that one are very good. Mm -hmm. Vision Charm, the blue one we've got Phase an Artifact out, Mill Someone 4, or All Lands of One Type are basic lands of your choice until end of turn, which is actually kind of interesting. Hearth Charm, the red one, uh, destroy an artifact creature. All attacking creatures get plus 1, plus 0, or a creature with power 2 or less is unblockable. Then we've got the white one, uh, Give a creature first strike, target player gains two life, or destroy an aura. So, mm. gain two life is funny. That's like... Pitiful. That's, like, yeah. pathetic. <laughs> that is like going to be... Tight. Hope Charm is by far the worst. Um, Actually, I mean, I'm given sorry. first strike, given first strike is not the worst. It's a it's a combat trick a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you're I, right. It's, it's probably the worst, but still. I, I still think I value, like... Uh, I guess Vision Charm is the worst in Limited. Um, Hope Charm is above that for sure, and Emerald Charm is probably also like below Hope Charm, just because the abilities on that limited aren't that great. Yeah, I mean charms, untap, untap, you can get a little bit of a blowout. Yeah, yeah, and and lose flying. I mean, two yeah. of the modes are actually could be relevant, but the chances are that it's still a better sideboard card. Yeah, Earth Charm is amazing. Earth Charm is really really good, and with chimeras in this set you know and stuff like that yeah destroy target artifact creature is still a like could have been a limited relevant ability and then in the full block it would have been a relevant ability on at times but all of your guys get plus one plus oh for one mana and this has different effects on it is really sick hearth charm is actually i think a little bit of a a sleeper um, but Funeral I, I, Charm's good, too. Yeah, I really like the Funeral Charm. Mm -hmm. How many examples of Instant Speed discard are there in Magic total? It's very few. So um, this is kind I, of... I think, it's, I think it's very... I think it's two. I think it is two yeah. cards, three. Yeah. Because they did Piracy Charm, too. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean... There's so few cards that do it. Because it's such a... I mean, during your draw step, uh, yeah. Funeral Charm? Mm -hmm. That's pretty harsh. It's pretty harsh. Yeah. If you're in top deck mode, this one just beats them. Yeah. So this is a cool one. I like that. And I do like that it's removal or a pump spell, too. That one seems pretty versatile. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, like, the it's also Swamp Walk. Yeah, you so know, my through. dude gets in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could be cool. Huge. This uh, cycle was okay. So it looks like Funeral Charm, Heart Charm are the big heavy hitters. Then yeah. coming in next, Emerald and Hope. We're talking for limited, I guess. And then Vision. Yeah. 
coming in. Vision last. has no purpose in limited, but Vision actually has more purpose in constructed, I think, than I mean, Emerald is actually sideboard uh, legacy playable because it's a one mana enchantment destruction spell. Hmm. Um, and Funeral Charm is obviously it was fine, I think, in standard when it was around. I I played it in a, a like a mono black rack discard deck with scooper and stuff like that and smallpox when uh time spiral was in standard okay cool cycle though uh i'm take it you don't like these pictures as much as the mirage charm cycle uh i don't know if they're as sweet but they're not they're still cool they're not even sweet at all actually i think they're okay (laughs) I think uh, I don't like the emerald much. I think the funeral looks kind of cool. Vision I looks kind of cool. Funeral is the coolest. Vision is all right. I'm not impressed with any of the other ones. Funeral is the coolest though. Um, I think I like the color scheme of it more, and these other ones are just kind of they're a little too plain. Mm-hmm. And I also don't like the. I guess I don't like the way that they're set up with the names emerald funeral vision hearth and hope you know don't like the names emerald is actually a jewel funeral is not anything that's like something and then vision hearth and hope are all a little better they're more abstract and they're something i see what you're saying but the first two emerald and funeral don't really make sense no that's a good point they didn't really have good name consistency there okay so next we've got a cycle of four cards and uh, jake and i kind of found something odd with this set was there seem to be two or i believe maybe even three cycles i think it's four actually four total so we have four cycles where each one is missing uh the fifth color as part of it so this one is the night cycle from visions we've got fallen ascari knight of the mists knight of valor and Sukata or Sukata Sukata Lancer, and each of these uh, have flanking and uh, another ability and another ability. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're the common knights basically from this set. And flanking is a cool mechanic. I enjoyed mm-hmm. that one. That's a cool one. Uh, it seems like they sort of went when they went Bushido. I guess I don't actually know which one's better. Bushido works both ways, attacking and blocking, whereas flanking gives actual negatives, so it can kill, like, you know, it can actually get rid of indestructible or get rid or of... Or death stuff. touch 1-1s. One yep. Yeah. So there there are some actual key differences between mm-hmm. flanking and, and Bushido. And also, like, burn spells become better, you know? Like, yeah, oh, your guy's right. negative 1, negative 1? Okay, then I'll shock it. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't do that with Bushido. That's very true. So that's kind of... That's a tough call to say which one's better. They might actually be about the same power level. Uh, as far as these knights go, which one's your favorite one? Or I maybe you I want like to rank Fallen them. Ascari is like the coolest looking and everything is cool about it. But yeah, it Knight of the well. Mist is my favorite just because, you know, I like that art. It's kind of weird. Um, so you can destroy, if you don't pay the one, you can destroy your opposing knights. With yeah. Night of the Mist? That's kind of mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. I wonder why... Otherwise, it, it could kill itself. It like. I see what they it's did. It's cool as a sideboard card, but the thing is, it wouldn't be good to play it in a blue deck normally because... There's not many knights. Yeah. yeah. It's like the only knight around. And... All right. Well, that's a reasonable cycle. Next, we have another four cycle. This is the Enter the Battlefield effect cycle. So we have Goblin Recruiter, Mana War, Necrotol, and Uktabi Orangutan. So Goblin Recruiter lets you search for any number of Goblin cards and then put the cards on top of your library in any order. Mana War is blue, and it lets you bounce a creature when it comes in. Necrotol is black, and it lets you destroy a non-artifact, non-black creature. And then the Orangutan is green, and it destroys an artifact. So... Uh, what was your reasoning for why you think they didn't have a white effect for this cycle? I actually don't really understand it myself. Um, I don't know. I don't really have a good reason. Yeah, they just I, so do it. they just sort of uh, omitted some cards from cycles, oddly enough. Well, and I think the Goblin Recruiter here is a little bit of a stretch. I think 
that card was probably designed more as a like just a cool effect for goblins and then it conveniently has a comes into play ability and it's you know almost like spell like what it does when it comes into play which was what all of these other ones are they're like a spell attached to a creature um so i guess i don't know if they just didn't think cuz even something as simple as gain 4 life would have been fine tacked onto a 2 3 yeah you know i guess they have they've definitely done that before so yeah. with the one so, the vigilant dude or whatever yeah so just anything like that would have been fine it's just funny that they couldn't find the place to put it mhm but this is it this is these are the four cards we got <laughs> Uh, next, we have a kind of cool one, Keeper of Kukus and Kukus. So Keeper of Kukus is a one-mana goblin that can give itself pro-red, which is actually kind of sweet. And then we have Kukus, which is a five-mana djinn, and he's not a legend still? No. Wow, that doesn't make sense since he has a name. Mm -hmm. Five-mana, three-five djinn with trample, and then during your upkeep, if you don't control a Keeper of Kukus, Kukus deals three damage to you, and he has to attack. If able. And he's got fire breathing, too. He's actually pretty good. That guy would have been yeah. sweet and limited. He's uh, not even bad with that don't have a Kukus out, or keeper a Kukus out. Uh, what's... He, is he just like a... He's on like a leash from the yeah. Keeper of Kukus? I see. Mm -hmm. That's weird. Uh, you can see the Keeper of Kukus in the Kukus art, too. Yeah, I so, love it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, you can see the relationship there. Kind of cool. Yeah. Should have been a legend, this one though. Is like a, yeah, you're right. This That's is weird. a really cool one, though. Okay, next we have Mystic Veil, Necromancy, Relic Ward, and Spider Climb. So this looks like a cycle of cards that you can play as an instant, but ordinarily they are enchantments. And I believe we saw this uh, cycle also present in Mirage. Yeah. Um, they actually did the whole final piece of it by giving Red one of them. But in Visions, they did not put a red aura in. Um, but they did put Parapet in white, which was just a regular enchantment for white. Uh, or for white. Uh, that just um, had this kind of kill it at, or destroy it at end of turn if you didn't, or if you flashed it in. Oh, okay. And they so gave similar. all your guys plus zero, plus one. Uh, the blue one in this cycle gives Shroud. Um... To a creature. Yep. Because the white one gives Shroud to an, an artifact. Oh, I see. Okay. And then the black one lets you res a card. Necromancy is actually just an insane one, which yeah. also sees cube play. But it's basically a three-mana enchantment that lets you bring a creature back. And if Necromancy leaves, the creature leaves. But you can yeah, still... It's, it's any graveyard. So it's actually just yeah. it's reanimate at instant speed without paying life. Yeah. And you could do it at sorcery speed for a permanent. But it does become an aura attached to the creature. It becomes that animate dead thing where yeah. it's an aura attached to the creature. I, I do like that one a lot. The fact that you can get the permanent res or you can get the combat trick res for some pretty brutal effect too. You know, Like if they're attacking in and you just want to maybe mm -hmm. bring a dude back and kill both of them, whatever. Yeah, can be. It's almost like a removal spell in that respect, which is cool. yeah. And using it with their own, like their best guy in their graveyard, yeah. knowing totally. it's gonna die at end of turn anyway, mm -hmm. no matter what you do, is really sick. I agree. We also have Spider Climb in green, which gives plus zero, plus three, and reach for one mana. So <laughs> um, another one of those just surprise blocks. I can do this. So you weren't expecting that. Um, yep. I think we talked about it in Mirage. They stopped doing this idea. Now just things have flash. That's just how yeah. it works. You don't have <laughs> yeah. to... There's really no reason to deny... Make it bury, yeah. Yeah. Or make you sack it or whatever. Just mm -hmm. kind of purposeless and weak. And, and auras are just not that good in general, so you really need to boost them by just letting them have flash. Uh, next we have Vampiric Tutor. Now this finishes off the Mirage cycle of tutors. We've got... We talked about Enlightened, Mystical, and Worldly. Well, Vampiric is actually worth a lot of money because it's an amazing card. You mm -hmm. pay two life, and you can search for any card, and then you put it on top of your library. So this is uh, probably, what is this worth, like 100 bucks or something? Maybe a no. little bit more? No, no, Not no. that much? Okay. 
I thought it was worth that so. much. It's not played in Legacy. It's banned in Legacy. Oh, I see. Okay. So... And as is Mystical. So if it were legal in Legacy, it'd be worth a lot more. I see. Well, uh, both Mystical and Vampiric are definitely definite staples of cube drafts and mm -hmm. uh, very cool cards. And yeah, Vampiric Tutor is no exception. Very, very powerful effect yep. there. And they're both great for Commander, obviously. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. All right, next we have, uh, this is going to transition us into Weatherlight. We have Chronotog and Necrotog. Now, these are also Atog creatures, like uh, Atog from Alpha, or Antiquities and Foratog from Mirage. We've got Chronotog, which is a 2-mana 1-2, and you can skip your next turn and then give him plus 3, plus 3, and you can only use it once each turn. And then we have Necrotog, which which is a 3-mana 1-2, and you can remove the top creature card in your graveyard from the game and give him plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. So uh, we see, unfortunately, another antiquated thing peeking its head uh, out from a dirty corner. We've got the... You have to remove a... You, the, there was a time when you had to keep track of the order of your graveyard, and uh, Necrotog made you do that. And uh, apparently... In formats such as, say, Legacy or Vintage, there are actual times where you have to um, pay you attention to the order. You always have to man maintain the order of your graveyard. Okay, in just older formats in yeah. general. Okay. Where because matters, they're, you have to do it. Yep, because they're just cards that... That actually know. consider which cards are where in your graveyard. So, uh, Necrotog's kind of cool, though. I could see building some sort of crazy self-mill deck at the time, maybe, or something crazy like that, mm. if you had enough creatures. Chronotog seems a bit sketchy. Having to skip your turn doesn't seem like something you want to do most of the time, even if you can get in for four at a cheap cost. Yeah, my guess is it's best with Final Fortune, where Final Fortune only cares if you have that turn and you lose it, the game at the end of it. So if you skip the turn where you would lose... You never have to lose the game. But you don't get the extra turn, do you? You don't get an extra turn, but you skip that turn that you would lose. So, you know, if it means that you're going to hit them for four, is it worth discarding the two drop, basically, or the two minutes spell? That's kind of funny. Yeah. It's still pretty. Uh, I guess Black it's luster. like it's still a control finisher. It's slow, but it's still a, a control finisher. Alternatively, yeah. it could also just sit back on defense um, in, like, a stasis build. Oh, okay. I you could just that. skip your turn during your opponent's turn each turn. I think most cards that skip turns uh, just kind of are a big turnoff to me in yeah. general for the most part. It's really tough to motivate me enough to want to skip my next turn. Yeah. There's not a I ton actually, of cards that do it. I think I think the stasis lock is actually the thing that was the reason to play it. I see. Because you didn't care about your turn at all with Stasis. Your plan was to tap them out so that you could just keep them tapped out. That's cool. Uh, not my style, but if people were playing that, that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Next we have a, another uh, weird cycle. We've got Aberroth, Heart of Begarden, Wave of Terror, Psychic Vortex, and Revered Unicorn. So Aberroth is green, and it's a 6-mana 9-9 with Cumulative Upkeep. You put a minus 1, minus 1 counter on it. Heart of Begarden is red with Cumulative Upkeep 2, colorless. And if it's not paid, it deals damage equal to its last paid Cumulative Upkeep to target player and each creature he or she controls. So that's kind of cool. It builds up and then becomes an explosion to your opponent mm -hmm. when you stop paying it. We have Wave of Terror, which is the black one with Cumulative Upkeep 1. And you can bury each creature with casting costs equal to the uh, Wave of Terror's last paid commute of upkeep. Psychic Vortex, which is blue, commute of upkeep, draw a card, and then at the end of each of your turns, you have to sack a land and discard your hand. And then we have a Revered Unicorn, which is a 2-mana two 2-3 two, with commute of upkeep 1, and if it leaves play, its controller gains life equal to its last paid commute of upkeep. So that's a sweet card, too, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you want to, first of all, say, how are these related? Uh, except for our... Uh, Aboroth, I guess. Aboroth? Yeah, Aboroth, probably, because, like, a tree. Oh, uh, okay. They all have, like, an effect that gets 
greater the longer you pay its cumulative upkeep. And by greater, I mean, like, you benefit more from having it out longer. Um, a Boroth just goes against the cycle by starting out really good and then just dwindling down like a traditional cumulative upkeep, but it's still cumulative upkeep in a way that wasn't done before, you know? And that was um, what this whole cycle was about, was putting a spin on cumulative upkeep to make it a benefit actually more than a negative. That's cool. I can get behind this. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is a cool cycle. How would you, if you were to rank them real quick, how would you I'd probably start with Heart of Bogodan or Revered Unicorn. As the strongest. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Um, And then Wave of Terror would be after those two. And then I don't personally like a Boroth that much. I like Psychic Vortex more, but discard your hand and sack a land. At the first turn, you get no benefit from it. So the turn you play it, you actually have to sack a land and discard your hand. Yeah, that is a little bit harsh. And then you, the first turn you have it out, you only are getting Howling Mine off it that turn. But if you can keep it out after that, it just gets exponentially better. Um, so Psychic Vortex has a lot of potential. Upside, um, yeah. You just, you, it's actually probably best with something like, uh, what's that, Sundial of the Infinite, or what is it where you can just end your own turn? Oh, yeah, no, that's Sundial of the Infinite. No, that is yeah. cool. I like that. This is a cool uh, take on commutative upkeep. Mm-hmm. Trying to uh, diversify, see what they could uh, come up with as far as yeah. other than other than just paying mana. Just so, being negative and yeah. being a pain in the ass, basically. Yep. These were and, actually things you wanted to continue paying for. Every That was the problem with the other things, was none of them were really great enough to keep around long enough to want to keep paying them. Yeah. You know. And just mechanics in general that are negative, they kind of yeah. stopped. They, like, stepped away from that idea. Because it's yeah. like, you don't, it's not exciting if you've got a negative mechanic. Mm-hmm. You want a mechanic that's positive, that's beneficial. Right. You know? So when they brought back that, and uh, I swear they brought back another one from Ice Age that was negative. Well, There's... cumulative upkeep was the worst offender. Oh, it was phasing was the other negative mechanic oh, I see. made up. Yeah. Um, yeah, when they did that in Mirage, it was just like, come on, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was another negative one. All right. Next, we have Abyssal Gatekeeper, Herloon Shaman, Mist Moon Griffin, Noble Benefactor and Veteran Explorer. So it looks like these all have when they die effects. Mm -hmm. The Abyssal Gatekeeper is black, and when it dies, each player has to bury a creature he or she controls. I actually really like that card. Yeah. Herloon Shaman, which is obviously red, and uh, when it dies, each player has to bury a land he or she controls. So they sack a land, each player. Uh, That one's actually kind of cool, too. Miss Moon Griffin, which is white. And when it dies, uh, exile it and then put the top creature card from your graveyard into play. That's sweet. So it's like a res. Yeah. But once again, order of your graveyard makes it a little bit obnoxious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have Noble Benefactor, which is blue. And when it dies, each player can search for any card and put that card into his or her hand. Wow. That's kind of crazy. So it's tutor for everybody. Yeah. And then we have Veteran Explorer, which is the green one. And when it dies, each player can search for... Uh, two basic land cards and put those lands into play. And they're untapped. Yeah. That's insane, too. Okay. So, uh, I I'm, I see the relationship now. It's uh, They all they affect every single player. Is that right? Except, yeah. actually, Except Miss Moon Griffin. Griffin. And, yeah. Okay. And I, it makes me think that this wasn't part of this cycle and that maybe they had, had other plans with this one. But um, it's funny because then White didn't get one. White doesn't have an effect that gave everybody a benefit for something dying. Yeah, that's weird that they didn't. They were like, "No, let's not give your opponent res." Just mm-hmm. one-sided, especially since yeah. res res is arguably the strongest ability out of all of. Yeah, these. it could have even been something as mundane as each player sacrifices or chooses and destroys an artifact or enchantment he or she controls. You know, like it could have been something like that that Herloon Shaman and Abyssal Gatekeeper kind of thing. Because Noble Benefactor is a tutor, veteran explorer, lets you land fetch. So 
it would make sense that that would have been the white one. So it's just funny that they decided not to do that at all. Yeah. That is to not even complete the cycle, and here it was sitting right in front of their faces, and they knew they were doing it. Yeah, that's really. This was a this was a weird uh, block for for cycles for half finished cycles. Yeah. yeah, that was really strange. It was just sort of and you're right doing doing the res thing would have been super easy for them too. So yeah, it to really make it double sided. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, next we've got Dingus Staff, which is a continuation of Dingus Egg, originally in Alpha. Dingus Egg from Alpha was a four-mana artifact, and whenever uh, a player <laughs> loses a land, loses a land, whenever so, a land is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, uh, the Dingus Egg <laughs> egg does <laughs> egg, egg does <laughs> two damage. <laughs> all right, Dingus Egg deals uh, two damage to the player. Uh, for each land lost face. and then dingus staff is a four mana artifact whenever it's the same thing except for creatures so uh you can see definitely a relationship here name similarity idea similarity mm-hmm. um not much to say about that just sort of a continuation mm-hmm. is there more dingus we're gonna get to later you don't have to say the names yet but is there more i i'm trying to think and i feel like there should have been but um I guess they would destroy artifacts. I think Magnetic Mine, and Maybe. not to say something, but like that one specifically is supposed to be, but I don't think we would include it because it's not a dingus. Yeah, yeah. It's not a dingus. <laughs> what a dingus. All hey, right. Weakest dingus. Uh, next we've got Fallow Worm and Harvest Worm. These are worm creatures with pretty similar art since they were both done by Stephen L. Walsh. Fallow Worm is a three mana, four, four green worm and when it comes into play you have to sack a land actually no you have to choose and discard yeah. a land card or you have to uh, sack it and then we have harvest worm which is a two mana three two worm and you can return a basic land card from your graveyard to your hand or you have or to sack it. Yeah. or you have to sack them so definite similarities there they're both the worms they're both the same artists they both have a something to do with put either putting a land in your graveyard or taking a land out of your graveyard or mm-hmm having to sack them so yes does it look like fallow worm is in winter too is that what that looks like to you yes definitely it looks like he's in snow and this is like spring actually it looks like he's it looks like he's shed as well is that supposed to be his skin that he took off i guess i was thinking it was like his weight or like or his his path uh, i see his path yeah yeah that makes sense too you know the other thing that's weird is harvest worm is clearly shown plowing a field with its tail yeah. When that doesn't make any sense if he's harvesting, you know, just saying. Hmm. Yeah. I see. You wouldn't get lands back if you were harvesting. You would just yeah, reap, you would reap it mana be called or something. Harvest. Yeah, it should be called plowing worm or something like that. Okay. Then. Uh, but this is a this is a cool little cycle. Which one of yeah. these is more playable? Fallow worm by far. Okay. But they certainly work well together. All right. Yeah, definitely do. Next, we have Gallo Braid and Morin Fen. These are both five mana black legend. Um, are they demons now? No, they're horrors. I, okay. I... So they're both five mana, five power, legendary horror creatures. Gallo Braid has Trample, Morin Fen has Flying, and they both have Cumulative Upkeep, one life. So yet another, <laughs> yet another take on Cumulative Upkeep. Yeah. These were cool though. I really like these two as a cycle. I, like I feel the picture. like yeah. yeah, I feel like Morin Fen is actually I want to place him on the building above Gallo Braid so that they're working in conjunction with each other, but uh, I know that that's not where he is, you know. Okay. Just based on where he actually looks more like he's further off to the side and the picture has an angle on it. They both also have quotes from Krovax, which is mm-hmm. I assume relevant. Um, that's cool. Yeah, this is a, both of these creatures terribly efficient, even for the time. And uh, black with efficient creatures is always very scary, since mm-hmm. they're supposedly, you know, the color with the worst creatures yeah. in terms of power levels. Well, once you have these out for four turns, what have they dealt damage to you? Uh, I guess the first turn they can attack is one life, then three... So six. by the time you've killed them, it will have already dealt 10 damage to you, I think? Yeah, so 
it deals 10 damage to you by the time you deal 20 with it. So That is actually quite a bit. So Yeah, I see. that's something to think about. But they're cool, nonetheless. Okay, next we have Southern Paladin. Now, this is a continuation of Northern Paladin, all the way back from Alpha. So, Northern Paladin is 2 and 2 white for 3-3, three, three, and you can pay 2, tap it, and destroy black permanents. And then... Uh, Southern Paladin is two white and tap and destroy a red permanent. So, I think Southern Paladin is actually cool. so much worse than Northern Paladin, but I, I love them both. Um, Southern Paladin just the, the removal that red has kills Southern Paladin in a way that's so much more upsetting than that's, the black removal that yep. can kill northern paladin no that's a good point and in addition to that what is red killing you with they're throwing fire at your face yeah, they're not exactly. throwing they're not throwing red permanents at your face yeah whereas the northern paladin could take out a, a nightmare or something early on or more in fan you know, or the big dudes yeah yeah, yeah. Juzam Jen, you know yeah southern paladin actually it doesn't they play what a thunder mayor maybe ball lightning yeah ball lightning yeah so you have to be ready to pay the two mana then and there. Yeah, you know? so you, you can prevent the six, ever, but that's about yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I agree. Uh, that's a good point. Northern Paladin is, is looking better than Southern Paladin. Weird. Oh, we're in Weird Harvest. Weird Harvest. Weird Harvest. This is the segment of the show where Jake and I talk about a weird card from the past. Now, when we're talking weird, we're specifically talking about the name and picture of the card, not uh, not how it was designed. Although the one we've got this week definitely can still, uh, it's designed it usually, oddly too. It usually goes to de design too, but okay. You know. So this week we've got Avino or Ovino Mancer, and uh, this is from Visions. It's three mana, O one, and when it comes into play, you have to bounce three basic lands or sacrifice them, and uh, you can tap them and return them to your hand, and then you can destroy a creature and put a sheep token into play under the control of the creature's controller, and it's a 0-1 green creature, which is kind of odd that it's green. I guess I would have expected white, but... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, at this time, they were giving it to green because it okay. was a, an animal, I a assume. A creature, a woodland yeah. creature. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a hilarious picture. I guess the name on this one, not necessarily... Uh, funny, unless there's something I'm overlooking with the name. Do you see any significance to the name Ovino or Ova uh, Ovino? I wonder if that well, pertains to I that animal. That ovine is like a type of family sheep are. Yeah, you should look that up. That's pretty cool if that's right. Then yeah. it's o of relating to or resembling sheep is ovine. If you describe something oh, as ovine, okay. So it's ovino mancer. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, what's hilarious about the design before we get into the picture? is you bring it in, you have to bounce three lands, then even when you first use it, you have to bounce it to your hand. So yeah. there's just so much that well, it sets you back. I mean, it's such a powerful effect. However, like, even in block, if you had Fervor out and Ovenomancer, it would just be a three-mana sorcery, exile a creature, and put a zero-one into play under its owner's control. Like, that's how it would be. Oh, I see. Just do it in response to the bounce ability. Yeah, so you don't have to bounce the lands. Your hand. Yeah. The thing was, though, um, at the time, in the rules, you had to resolve all upkeep triggers before you could activate abilities, and the same was true with comes into play effects. You had to resolve all of those before you could activate the creature's abilities. So, like, you had to deal with the return three basics or bury it thing before you could tap to Oh, activate. okay. All right, so, so even giving it haste at the time wouldn't have mattered. I see. So it's better now than it was yeah, then. Yeah, it's much better now. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the picture. Let's dive right into it. So we've got uh, a guy, uh, and you've seen uh, Monty Python, the Holy yeah, Grail. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely Tim this yeah. time. Like, it's they, Tim the Enchanter. From, <laughs> if you uh, thought it was Tim. Uh, with Prodigal, Prodigal Sorcerer, Sorcerer, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, this one is Tim. Yep. So this is definitely Tim that is unmistakable headgear mm -hmm. with the the yeah, sheep horns the, on it. Yeah, yeah, the double horn skull cap. Yep. And uh, he's, I presume he just snapped his finger or he just held his hand up or he, something like that. I, I, I want to say he snapped his finger. I so it's safe to assume. And uh, he's not looking at a knight behind him, but uh, he just transformed a knight of some sort into a sheep. 
and uh, the sheep's facial expression is absolutely hilarious. It's, it's like hilarious, a, yeah. it's a surpri surprise. It's a mixture of surprise and fear. <laughs> and <laughs> it is surprise. So you get this awesome surprise uh, sheep expression. I love the sheep legs straight out of uh, like <laughs> a iron armor plate. You know, yep. it's so great. And you get a little sheep tongue in there too. You get yeah. a little pink tongue. Yeah, the art is really great. If yeah. you are an audio listener, definitely check out the art. Yep. So Kevin Walker did a great job on that. Yeah. I like it. And I it's just, like it's exactly. a funny picture. It's perfect for Weird Harvest. Mm -hmm. I feel like Kevin Walker's art has gotten progressively worse, actually, which oh. is sad to say. Oh, no. Because well, this is a really, really good piece. If Kev Walker listens, I'm sorry. I, I, don't, yeah, hold sorry, that. I don't hold that same uh, belief <laughs> I, until I see it. <laughs> yeah, and you know I'm classically trained in all art, so my my opinion is totally yeah all all forms of art by the way. Okay, well, um, I hope you enjoyed it. We we had a pound through quite a bit there, but uh, I'm satisfied, and uh, I appreciate you guys joining us this week. And uh, stay tuned for some vintage masters coming right around the corner. And uh, until then, enjoy some more Journey into Nyx drafts. Also, check out the Seems Good Magic card giveaway. I give away cards every week. This week, I'm giving away a uh, FNM promo dissolve, so that one's kind of exciting. Nice. All you have to do is uh, name your uh, one of the worst counter spells and then why it's the worst. And uh, also, check out uh, last week's Mortar Pod uh, if you want to do. If if you didn't catch last week's, you might want to because there's some sort there's some interactions between the one we just did visions and weather light and mirage so you can sort of see uh the overall idea of how they did the cycles for the block all right well uh thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week